Welcome to Modern Musings, conversations with the maiden, mother, and crone, where we look at ourselves and the world through the lens of the 21st century. Hey guys, thanks so much for coming back. Kristen here, and I'm with my co-hosts Amber and Cindy. How's it going? Hello. We're super excited today because we're actually going to be having our first podcast episode on a book that we decided was really important for us to read together. Um, this book is called A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. You probably did see on our um, social media and our blog. Hopefully you got a chance to take a look at the book and read it along with us ahead of time. But if you haven't got a chance, go ahead and check it out. There's a link where you can get the book if you want to read along with us. It's available on Kindle or bookstores everywhere. Um, it is actually one of Oprah's book club series and uh, very profound. So we really wanted to share um, what we've been reading about. Cindy had already read the book and she encouraged me. It's like, oh, you got to check out this book. Um, you, you know, it's something that she like kind of stewed on and it took her a while. And then she was like, okay, yeah, you need to read this book. You, you got to read this book. She kept like bugging me. Hey, have you read that book yet? And then it was like, okay, we need to read this book now. So we're ready. And we read the first two chapters. So today we're going to start just kind of unpeeling it like an onion going through the layers. Um, I, started highlighting some things that I wanted to discuss um, before we dive into that though just want to have a little disclaimer that we're still debating on how to say his name so there have been uh, different ways that we've heard it on the internet and uh, we uh, looked at how his name is supposed to be pronounced based on the you know since we were calling it Eckhart Tolle. Right. Uh, uh, and that was uh, one of the podcasts before we were saying, you know, hey, get the book uh, from Eckhart Tolle. And then I was watching a um, series where Oprah actually had him and they were doing like a Skype with like hundreds of people. And she called him Eckhart Tolle. And I was like, oh, my God, did I say his name wrong all this time? And then. We went online and there was other things saying that it was Some of them Tol. said Eckhart Tolle and some said Eckhart Tolle. Yeah, Tolle. 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 Yeah. yeah. And, and that Tol-y. it's not Tolle. So bear with us. We are from Texas and we do pronounce things our own little way. So yep. we're still debating on it. So you may hear it all different ways. But uh, we're here to peel this onion with you guys today. And what an onion it is. Um, this book, I, I, as Kristen mentioned, I sat and read this a while back. And, you know, it, the first half of the book was really challenging for me. I like to read at night before I go to bed. And um, this book was actually recommended by another friend of mine a while back. And I decided to read it. And it took me a long time and it, uh, I'm normally a fiction reader. So, um, this isn't my style. So it's a little drier than I'm interested in for, for the most part, but I just kept reading it and kept reading it. And it was like, okay, okay, okay. And then all of a sudden towards the end, things started to click. And once the things started to click, all the little pieces started, it was like, when you're building a jigsaw puzzle and you start out with the outside edge and you start putting things in and it doesn't look like much, but all of a sudden you get to this point where you can't stop because all the pieces are starting to find a place and the picture is starting to make a difference and you just start frantically trying to find all the pieces to finish it. And, and then even after I finished the book, things just kept coming forward and coming forward and coming forward. And, you know, as I mentioned before, when I came to use my pick, my word of the year, um, for one little word for 2022, guess what word came up now? And that was a recurring theme in this book. And I didn't even realize that it had made that much of an impact until, months after I read the book. So 
that was why I kept encouraging Kristen to come back and look at this book with me, you know, and so I wanted to discuss it with her. And um, so that's kind of where we are with this. Right. Uh, It's really deep. Oprah actually calls him the father of now. And you'll understand that when you start to get into the chapters. He really does have to set himself up in the first chapter to get your mind in the right so you can understand. frame of mind yes uh, and, it was literally and it's talking about your mind and I think that that's is what the hard was so part dry to wrap for me it's really hard to wrap your mind around it but the more you think about it mm-hmm. the more you read it like going back and reading it the second time for this discussion with um in keeping in mind that i was making notes um for this podcast i, I caught even more things than i caught the first time and i was really really fascinated by some of the things that came up and the recurring themes and my understanding was deeper and deeper and deeper so um i'm really excited that kristen wanted to bring this to you um this week and well this is going to be ongoing obviously because yeah this is not a book you can just read the book and then have a discussion it's this is a, a multitude of discussions over time. Right. And so you will see us, we'll pop back on um, with some bonus podcasts yeah. now and then where we come back to this We'll story. definitely yes. make sure that everybody gets enough time to read. That's why we wanted to give you ample time last, you know, when we told you about it in one of the podcast pop-ups, you know, that we were having this book reading because... I knew that it's on this, you know, sliding scale of philosophy and, you know, as taking a philosophy class before, um, you know, it was just a philosophy 101 and I remembered that it was challenging to read that and if you're not used to reading those type of things, you do really, it's not like reading a book, you just don't go line after line after line, you have to read one line at a time and really absorb him and I feel yeah. like this book especially, yes, each sentence bites and right. you put it in your mouth yeah, and so chew it and you you know don't just when i was reading it like it it's taking me a little bit longer and i'm to be honest with you our uh discussion our idea was to do chapter one and two i'm still currently reading two i just have like two pages left it looks like but i've been taking one sentence at a time and i feel like i have to read one sentence and then i sit and i have to like think about it and absorb it Mm -hmm. and that's probably kind of what happened with you when you read it you were kind of stewing in it was in your subconscious you know yeah it was it was in my subconscious and and I didn't even realize it until all those little pieces started coming back to click and I was like because when I first read it I was like well this was a really interesting book and I I had some good takeaways from it but it was just an interesting book and then all of a sudden like weeks later some like recurring theme would pop up and and I was like that's that's what makes this book so important and now I understand why Oprah gushed about it for so long mm-hmm. um because it really is a profound um and interesting topic and I really think it's really applicable to multicultural um socioeconomic religious boundaries do not apply it it's all encompassing and well he's writing it for all of humanity yeah basically and that it's a pretty lofty goal um and i like i said i i'm just really fascinated with it so um where do we where do you want to kick um, off with it well Kristen? actually um just kind of speaking on the fact that he's writing this to humanity um in the first chapter he's talking about um this flower blooming like the first flower blooming there was just one or two and then at some point then flowers evolved to like all bloom mm-hmm. and um, he has a whole segment at the beginning about observing this flower um and not looking at it as a flower and like labeling it and just going well it's pink and it comes in the springtime and I can see the stamen and the pestle and the you know all the different parts of the flower um but actually just looking at it and you know quieting your mind he 
uh, back to like him writing to humanity, there was a part in the book that um, kind of rang to me because I, you know, wondered how many people would be able to read this book and understand it because I felt that it was challenging. Um, and I know there's other people with way better reading skill levels than me that probably have a lot of easier time reading it. Um, <clears throat> but I do like it because it is a challenge. But there was a sentence that I highlighted. It made me smile. This book is about you. It will change your state of consciousness or it will be meaningless. And I feel like if you're reading it and you're having a hard time, understanding it you know you can come back and read it again it might make more sense right. later yeah mm -hmm. um totally but and uh, it, it wasn't meaningless to me the first time around right, by right. any means no yeah it's just it was like stewing right but i thought how exciting he's telling you that when you read this you are either going to finish this story or the story <laughs> finish this book i'm a fiction reader too you finish this book coming out on the other side of it with a sense of enlightenment I mean the whole idea of the book is that you are awakening and to your true self and knowing your purpose um, if you don't come out of that at the end it is meaningless to you um, so I, I highlighted that it made me laugh um, well I think one of the things right before that he actually mentions that um the ideas and the concepts presented here may be important, but they are secondary. They're really only a signpost pointing towards your awakening. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the important thing that as you are reading this, if you are comprehending it, you are, it is beginning to change you because you are mm -hmm. awakened. It is awakening you, if that uh, makes any sense. Yeah, um, I feel like that most people go through life in a sort of a blur where they don't really know what their purpose is they're not truly awake they don't know they just go from day to day pay bills they don't really know what their meaning or what the purpose is in their life or what they even want to strive for they don't have any goals they're just uh robots if you will well and i i've been there too not maybe not not a robot but having uh, no sense of purpose or not having a goal because i didn't know what it was i was yeah i was lost and and i've been through p parts of my life where i felt that way you know um as a mother and and we'll get into this in the story or in the discussion as well but um as a, a someone who has raised children i i'm a mother identified myself as a mother and then once my children were grown i felt like i needed something to identify with mm -hmm. i i felt like i had no purpose anymore what is my purpose what is my goal and i spent a lot of time you know trying to figure out what that was right amber you had mentioned um being like a robot in a sense mm -hmm. um there is another place um in chapter one that i had highlighted um i'll read it really quick it's a small chap a uh, small uh, paragraph and then kind of paraphrase what i had gotten from that um once there is a certain degree of presence of still and alert attention in human beings perceptions they can sense the divine life essence, the one indwelling consciousness or spirit in every creature, every life form, recognize it as one with their own essence and so love it as themselves. Until this happens, however, most humans see only the outer forms, unaware of the inner essence, the inner essence, just as they are unaware of their own essence and identify only with their own physical and psychological form which is your body and your mind mm -hmm. a robot is nothing more than a mechanical body and components that make a computer a body and a mind mm -hmm. what sets humans apart from a robot our soul exactly and that yeah. was what i got from this uh, little chapter or i'm sorry this little paragraph is that you know 
until you can recognize that your soul is also a part of you and that is your true identity yeah, not your not, body, not, your, not looks. your looks, and not your, your mind. Materials. Your brain is an organ. Well, and he and, he mentions this that that it what a lot of us identify with, and we think our mind is who we are, and um, that's not your. You think I am, but you that voice that says I am is not really you. Right. You are the voice right. that is hearing your body say right. I am. So if you took a robot and you knew that he was all steel parts and computer parts, and if you had the ability to put a soul in it, his computer would not be his identity. It would be his soul, right? So right, why yes. can't that, that would be for you too. Yes. So yes. there's no yes. way that our mind, our brain is who we are. It is no. has to be something else. Right. Because the, the, we are just flesh robots. We are. We are. We are, we with are a biological soul. robots, biological sentience. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he talks about the uh, the awakening and the finding it. And he's, um, he, when he's talking about, the awakening you know he says some some people start to awaken to that sense of soul that sense of purpose or whatever it is um through suffering or loss a lot of times that's how it happens for them um because once you've lost everything then you can see clearly um it's people get blinded by their material yes possessions. yes and um and material wants and needs right and, and that's actually and where status like the, chasing the second chapter kind of picks up so right. like the first but chapter the, he's really identifying like who, who you, you are who you are he has yeah. to he has to explain to you in a, a way so that you can go oh wow i am not my brain i am not the shirt on my back i am not the skin on my body that's just a part of the capsule that right. my soul is in right. my soul is me my soul does not have lips so it uses my brain to make sounds mm -hmm. but my brain has all those other things going on and that's what he's talking about is the ego so that's really what he brings up in chapter one is the ego and identifying with the ego and, right and figuring and out like the is. difference between mm -hmm. the two and where that has harmed humanity. Um, he kind of talks about how um, humanity has uh, done terrible things. Oh, I think yeah. that actually might have been in the preface. Well, uh, but there's he, not a preface in every book. No, but, he talks yeah. about oh, it in chapter, chapter one. one okay. He talks about World War II and right. Hitler okay, yes. and yes. Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and the Holocaust Yes. Well, and he and he talks about communism too, and the you know the reason that communism failed was not because it wasn't a great idea. Wouldn't it be a great idea if everything was equal? But the problem with that was that um, you can't change humanity through intent. You have to actually change the way we perceive our world. And so as long as there are still people who are tied to those material things and identify through the power or the money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or whatever, um, and those parts of the ego, as long as there's still an ego, then that's we will the always have ego. problems. Mm -hmm. And that's one of his things that he's talking about. If we don't find a way to awaken ourselves to what we really are we're coming to a bigger catastrophe we are coming to a big catastrophe and our world our for. world is not going to be able to support us any longer mm -hmm. because we are consumer driven and we are selfish and our Social governments media hate driven our governments hate other governments and we oppress people and we are intolerant of other people who think differently than we are or who look differently than we do or who love differently than we do. And until we can stop letting our ego drive that, 
and and look outside of our ego and see who we really are and see that we are all really made of the same essence. Mm -hmm. The same source is within all of us. Everybody is the same. They're... It doesn't matter skin color. It doesn't matter religious right, background. Right, because that doesn't make who you are. That's not, right. yeah, those it's, things are not who you are. So, yeah. and and um, he goes really in depth in this. I I hope that you have been reading along with it because I, I really thought it was very fascinating um, the way he talked about the ego and... Um, the things that we use to identify ourselves and um, it's kind of, I don't know. It's um, we're, we're kind of raised from birth to identify with things. Yeah. With our possessions, our social status, Uh, uh, rich people versus poor people. I am the the shrinking middle class. The daughter of Marie. I am the mother of Kristen. I am a female. I am married. I live in a house. um, Like check off the boxes on a thing. Like you, uh, people are raised to categorize themselves as you know identify as certain things like uh you were born a female so you must be a female and i do like that those lines are blurring a little bit as people do become more awakened to what they are on the inside because not everybody identifies as just male or female. Not everybody identifies as just Christian or atheist. There are people that have mixtures of beliefs of all of that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the world is not just one color. It's not just black and white. There are many shades of gray and we are awakening slowly but as long as people are stuck on the material things and the status the facebook likes the views on tiktok then we won't fully awaken as a society and um eckhart toll says that we will destroy ourselves yeah you know what there's actually you were talking about like status and stuff there was in chapter two something that i really liked um and this is interesting because it's kind of like in that communist thing uh with the equality and stuff um you know right now we have a huge gap in um versus poverty versus like the two percent yeah and it's slowly it's like it's getting Gaping. bigger. The gap getting is getting bigger. bigger. Yeah, that's what I'm so to say. imagine this, because we can't even fathom this. This does not exist in our world. But imagine if it did. If everyone lived in a mansion or everyone was wealthy, your mansion or your wealth would no longer serve to enhance your sense of self. Right. So people who feel like their wealth is an identifier of who they are like they i'm are. poor or i'm rich mm-hmm. um i'm wealthy i'm you know a multi-millionaire entrepreneur i see so many people on like manifesting boards that are talking about how they manifested ten thousand dollars and uh the posts just come and come and come and then they're p- taking pictures of like they manifested you know mercedes i'm like that's pretty awesome that you manifested that that's great but i also feel like that is very close-minded um thing to manifest not to judge anybody but um maybe manifest ending world hunger right absolutely Mm -hmm. i feel like those things just make the gap bigger right and that doesn't help your ego it just makes your ego more it gives it more attention well that's what and that's one of the things that he talks about is the ego seeks to exist Mm -hmm. and and it will keep grabbing on to more things to uh 
make it stronger. It will resist you getting rid of it. It um, it keeps trying to identify with the next better thing, the next get the next better hold on you, um, and and we will you know we as a result we try to fill ourselves up with more and more things to make us feel alive basically because yeah. we're identifying with the ego and we think that the ego is us and mm. the ego's only purpose is to survive and so yeah, it keeps to grabbing itself, at things so to grab things and you know like i he mentions uh, the illusion or the illusory self i i i me 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 mm -hmm. my 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 and that uh if you don't let go of that then the world will destroy itself because right. like all you're doing is thinking only of yourself about yourself right and and part of the reason for that is we're trying to feel the life in ourselves and we can't feel it so when you're no longer uh, as he says no longer feel the life that you are um then you're likely to try to fill it up your life with things and um i you know and to that i put food liquor drugs sex um buying material things things we to just make you forget things right. to make you forget makes you feel more feel 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 and um do do things are there things in your life that um induce a subtle feeling of importance or superiority and you know he talks about that do you identify with things um if you have a lack of these things does it make you feel inferior to others? That's your self. Yeah, the ego sense of self self worth is in most cases bound up with the worth you have in the eyes of others. You need others to give you a sense of self. And if you live in a culture that to a large extent equates self worth with how much and what you have, which is the United States Oh, oh our, yeah. exactly. Culture. Our whole culture exactly. is bound around that. It's how much you have, the have and the have nots. If you cannot look through this collective delusion, you will be condemned to chasing after things for the rest of your life in the vain hope of finding your worth and completion of your sense of self there. And that um, was like, oh, wow, that's a ring ding dinger for me. And I kept reading and just like a couple paragraphs later, this one ring home to me um a lot because i actually identified when you were talking about like food and liquor and those um vices that people get trapped crave. In. yeah they want it because it alters them it gives them that sense that they've received something mm -hmm. and they may not even know what it is that they're replacing what it is that they want they may not even know that they want something and i i actually had an epiphany reading this so in this one I highlighted, in some cases, the psychological need for more or the feelings of not enough that is so characteristic of the ego becomes transferred to the physical level and so turns into insatiable hunger. The sufferers of bulimia will often make themselves vomit so they can continue eating. Their mind is hungry, not their body. I personally don't suffer from bulimia, but I do have an eating disorder. And I, it's something even after weight loss surgery, I still struggle with. Um, because I, you know, talking with my therapist about it, you know, I would find myself after the day is done Wanting with to work. Feel full. I, yeah. what well, it wasn't even the feeling of full. I would be sitting at like my table and I know I have X x uh tasks to do on my list and a lot of them end up being things that i have to sit down and do like um maybe writing a blog post or going online and paying a bill or um you know doing some research on something that i need to make a choice on like which hotel i'm gonna stay at when i go on a trip or something those type of things i end up delaying them because sometimes i will get up and go get a snack or I'll go and get another drink and then I'll find myself going into the kitchen like four times in a span of like two hours just to get a little nibble of something. I'm not hungry, but what it is is I'm wanting to be 
somewhere else except where I am at that moment. And um, he actually talks about that Mm -hmm. um, later in chapter two. um, And I will read this quote. Most egos have conflicting, conflicting wants. They want different things at different times or may not even know what they want, except that they don't want what is the present moment. Unease, restlessness, boredom, anxiety, dissatisfaction are the result of unfulfilled wanting. Wanting is structural, so no amount of content can provide lasting fulfillment. As long as that mental structure remains in place, intense wanting that has no specific object can often be found in the still developing ego of teenagers, some of whom are in a permanent state of negativity and dissatisfaction. So, um, you know, that's what he's talking about. Um, you know, just you're, you want to be anywhere, but now, and, um, I, I know this for a fact when I was a smoker, um, I quit smoking in 2007 and when I would be working and I got at a hard place in um something I was writing uh and I couldn't think what to say I didn't want to just sit there in that and so that would be my cigarette break I would get up go smoke a cigarette be anywhere but where I was supposed to be same as going to get that snack it is it's same as getting the snack and um and I would you know cleaning cleaning the bathroom or whatever and I would do a little thing and it's like okay I'm gonna go have a cigarette break because I want to be anywhere but there I want to find anything to be anywhere but in the present moment Mm -hmm. and that is a lot of what this book is about is being in the present moment and um the ego doesn't want to be in the present moment and the ego wants to be filling itself up uh, you know like we talked about with things um i i like to think of the ego as like a box um our mind is like a box a never fulfilled box yes it's like a mary poppins bag yes yes the bag of holding from the bag of holding from um yeah from uh, D &D. D &D. so (laughs) it it, you know yeah hermione's bag from um (laughs) harry potter yes so we are nerds we're such like big nerds but um so so it's this box or this bag or whatever and it's it's a container um the ego is nothing without the things that are in it because, because that's how it identifies it's always thirsty our, and so always and our it, brains and have you could to just keep putting things, things in, in it buckets. and, and yeah. there's so many things we just keep putting in the bucket and um and that's where it's it's really gets hard to separate yourself from those things and um a lot of these first two chapters are talking about the many different ways that the ego tries to identify itself. It's like it's trying to prove that it exists. And and oh, um, point. that it is, the, it's mm-hmm. trying to convince you that it is you. But so that it can hang on and hang on. Um, we identify with illness. We identify with our parents. We identify with all these different things. And you it how do you let go of those well you can't do it by thinking it right you can't and he says don't even try um it's impossible attachment to things starts to drop away by itself when you no longer seek to find yourself in them Mm -hmm. so when you quit identifying yourself with being a mother or being a sufferer or of some illness or when you no longer think of yourself as a poor person or a fat person or a skinny person or a healthy person you're constantly striving to have a More. look a, a physical look that people recognize you as like a diva for instance right. like a diva 
doesn't want to be caught dead in public looking like she just rolled out of bed. She wakes up looking like she a diva. She has an identity of For that. those that have surgeries to, like, become human Barbies. Right. Um, right. Exactly. Well, and exactly. even just yeah. normal people who are right. beautiful but who are wrapped up in, if they identify with, with their, their beauty. beauty or their healthfulness or... Um, you know that they're physically fit those things are bad too because then the first it time comes they obsession. have a well and and when they have an accident and then can't work out or right. they give birth and they gain some pounds or uh, they get older and your body doesn't work the same way then they've lost their identity as a beautiful person and yeah. and that's just as hard on them as it is on um, the bulimic girl who thinks she weighs too much or um, the young man who's in a wheelchair and can't play basketball even though he wants to or whatever, you know. Um, so Someone we have born to... on the wrong side of the tracks. Yeah. That grows up saying, you know, I I'll was born never, on the wrong yeah, side I'll of the tracks. Anything because it's I always going to be a struggle for me. I'm never going to be, you know. And I am actually, and I'm not going to say like a... I used to have that mentality because I grew up poor. Me too. I Me mean, too. my family, we might not have looked poor because my mother was all about like looks, like even if we, and that's something that I do notice about a lot of poor people is that they strive not to look poor. But um, I grew up with, you know, that mentality that, uh, you know, I'm poor, I'm never going to go to college, I'm never going to become anything with my life, and I pulled myself up, and I went to college I applied for many scholarships I went to college and this is something that I like to tell my students is that I made it happen I didn't sit there and say no I'm too poor for this it's never going to happen no I found a way to pay for college and once I started making all A's then I was getting grants to pay for college and I pulled myself through it, and now I feel like I am very successful in my life. I know a lot of people wouldn't say that if you ask one of my students, they wouldn't think that teachers are successful, but I feel like I inspire a lot of people, and I have former students that still come to me today and tell me how much they love me for inspiring them. That is exactly where the ego can get you in trouble because – People identify with wealth being successful. Yes. And that, we had talked about that before in a podcast about goals. And um, someone that we know had mentioned like, oh, I don't need goals because I'm well, you know, I retired. I really talking about wealth. I was talking about like a right. success for, you know, I feel like I have success in life because I am helping people. Right. Well, and that's why I'm saying is that you recognize that part of your identity in a way is that you know because you I don't are make happy. a lot of money <laughs> you you are successful because you're happy and yes. that's where some people see success as wealth that's what I was trying to say oh okay um and I was thinking about our friend who had um mentioned that she didn't set goals at one point because she always thought about goals being for people who wanted to be entrepreneurs it was wealth based mm -hmm. and success mm -hmm. had something yeah. to do with monetary and that's your ego taking something that it's put in its box and it has identified it as such it says success wealth goals those go in the same bucket together yeah. poor your job is meaningless because that's why you're poor because your job isn't a wealthy job mm -hmm. your life is meaningless people put those assumptions and thoughts in their own minds you know because 
of sorting. You are taking any data. Those your, are voices in your, your head. Your mind takes all the data, everything it's picking up, everything you look at, everything. It goes, ooh, I don't like that. I like that. I don't like that. I like that. I don't like that. I like that. It's all yes, no, yes, no. It's that binary, right? Mm -hmm. It's putting it in a bucket and then it sorts things and then some things get attached like wealth and success and happiness and then over here you have poor poverty unhappy discontent, discontent yeah. right and so you attach those feelings to that so you're great because you can see that you're doing what makes you happy that is success because that is ultimately what we're here for is to enjoy our life yes. and to have purpose um, if your purpose is only to just continue to fill that box, you are missing out. And that's really what he's saying is if we continue living that way where we're just filling that box with things, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then actually like believing what all the yes, no's are instead of just feeling it how we know it, mm -hmm. then we will destroy ourselves. Right. And that, and that is one of the, he's, he talks about the, at this point, um, because our rampant consumerism, um, you know, we are on the verge of destroying our world right now. And, and really these first two chapters are, are about two different, two, two things. Um, one is talking about the change that must come. Um, and, and change we must, because if we don't, our species will die. Um, and then he's, he's trying to show us in low, slow onion peeling steps, um, what it is that we're trying to change. And I, I want to touch on a couple of things. You know, he's, again, he's talking about the, the temporary unfulfilled wanting that rampant consumerism, all of those things. Um, what is happening is that we are destroying our earth with that. We have, we are creating so much waste material that our seas are floating with it. Um, I read a statistic the other day that uh, newborn babies are have so much microplastics in their bodies already wow. from the water that we drink because it's in our oceans and it's you know all these all this pollutants that are in there and um because the particles don't just go away they don't just go away they just get disintegrated down like so the, the silica one they can um yeah. yeah and so they're micro particles and we're we actually have them in us now and um and the the just the various things that we're doing we're melting the polar ice caps and i know a lot of people don't believe in um global warming and things like climate that change. but and the climate change but there there's a lot of science and evidence that it is happening and and even beyond that the things that we're doing with our world we're um, there are people who are oppressed all over the world who continue to be oppressed. The wealthy get wealthier, the poor are poorer and poorer. And, um, COVID is a prime example of what is happening to our earth. Um, here is this rampant disease that has, uh, basically, stalled our world um we're has having a foothold on us it, it really does and and it's it's stopped our production it has stopped our shipping it there's all kinds of things that it has affected and whether you believe in it or whether you don't believe in it the covid pandemic has had an effect on everyone and um you know, for whatever reason, I'm not going to go into that argument here. That's not what this podcast is about. Um, but you, no one can argue that we've had um, problems with shipping and delivering and manufacturing and things like that for whatever reason due to this pandemic. And uh, all over the world, people are having problems. There's more sickness. There's more issues. There's more um power hungry dictators that are oppressing their people and doing things and and we are having more and more and more people populating this earth and we don't have 
the ability to sustain that population growth because we don't have a way to manufacture enough food to feed everyone and we are running out of resources. And so that is where he's talking about this is a crisis. Um, and he really doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about this. I'm really spending more time than he did talking about it because I, this is one of the reasons I think it is so important because the only way that we're going to change our earth is not by changing the things in our earth. And this kind of goes back to the communist, um, the reason why communism failed. Um, we, you can't, make that kind of change without changing what's in people's hearts you can't just make everybody abide by think about the masks okay yeah so wearing a mask is socially acceptable way to prevent covid from spreading and to keep you from getting it right right you're it's a two-way street right people have the choice not to to wear the mask yeah yes because it although it has been mandated there are still ways Obviously, there's medical reasons. I'm not even going to go into that. But people have the choice now to not wear it. And you see people walking around, even though we still have all these variants, choosing not to wear the mask. And that's where you can't just force everyone to be socially good. Right, right. You can't. So what we have to do is start to awaken everyone we have to and from within you from within you can't do it from outside you can't change what's happening on the outside you can only what you have to do is change what is inside and as you change what is inside of people then our outside world starts to change right and the the way to change what is inside is to be aware of of those fixations to be aware that you are identifying yourself so think about it um you you can't we're and he's not saying don't have an appreciation for the nice things um it's okay to appreciate your nice house and to drive your nice car but what he's talking about is when you identify identify yourself with those things it becomes who you are it becomes who you are or you think it is who you are so then you have to ask yourself is this who i am do i identify myself with this fancy car if i lost that fancy car would i be less of who i am because of it um same thing with your job if you're you have this nice job maybe if you lost that job would you be less of who you are because you don't have that job um you can apply that to anything in your life and if the answer is yes i am diminished by that loss i am a less of who i am because i don't have that then you are using that to identify yourself right it's just a job i mean you're replaceable at whatever job you're at they will find somebody else to replace you within two seconds after you Mm -hmm. quit so i mean it's just a job it doesn't define you it's not who you are and and he actually has a list of things you can kind of go through the steps um so if you think about something uh see if you want to identify with something if do you, when you think about the loss of that thing, mm-hmm. does it make you upset and anxious? That's um, interesting because, you know, and I've been thinking about that a lot, even just looking at my fuzzy socks that I'm wearing right now. I'm We're totally lounging, guys. I am wearing fuzzy socks because who does not do a book discussion without wearing something cozy, right? So I have these fuzzy socks that my mom gave me for Christmas and they have little penguins on them and I love them. And quit bumping your mic. (laughs) (laughs) I would be sad if they disappeared, but would I even notice if they were gone? If one day they just didn't show up back in my drawer, I have like 50 pairs of fuzzy socks. They are not me. They're just something that I love. And, uh, if I noticed they were gone, yeah, I would be sad. Like, oh, man, those were cute. But probably 
five years from now, I wouldn't even remember what they look like. I couldn't tell you what the penguin was doing on the sock. But he he actually gives an example of where a case where you are tied, um, where someone is tied to an object, and it gives them a lot of distress. And um, this in this particular case, it was a client of his. He was um, giving her some counseling. She was at the end stage of, I think, cancer, if I remember correctly. Um, she had an illness, and she was at the end stages of her life. And he was sitting by her bedside, and she was um, bemoaning the fact that her treasured ring had disappeared. And she thought her, uh, was it her housekeeper House or, or, a, yeah. or a caregiver had taken it. And um, she was very upset and angry about this ring. And he was like, what why are you so upset about a ring? And, um, she said, well, you know, it's not just any ring. It was my grandmother's ring. Why could I not be upset? You know, I only took it off because my hands were too swollen and that ring is very special to me. How can I not be upset? And he's, his point, um, in that was, was to go back to her and it, and it goes back to these questions. How do you know if you are identified with an object or whatever? Um, he's talking about how important is this ring to you? And, uh, I know a lot of us have similar items. I, I have my wedding ring, um, you know, or, or other things. There are other things, gifts that have been given to me or that were passed down through my family. And his, his question to her was, do you realize that you're going to have to let that ring go? You're going to, you're going to die, you know, basically is what he's saying. You're going to die and you're not going to have that ring anyway. So, um, you know, how important is that ring? And, you know, you become less of who you are because you don't have that ring with you when you die. And, you know, and she she took some time to think about it and um she said you know my first my first answer was yes uh, you know i'm i'm going to be diminished by that and then she asked herself the question again and um who is who i am has that become diminished by the loss of that ring this is now remember this is a person who is on her deathbed and she is you know, really torn up about the loss of this family heirloom ring. And she's asking herself, am I diminished? Am who I am fundamentally diminished by the loss of that ring? And then she said, suddenly she had the answer. She suddenly had a sense of who she was. Mm -hmm. And she said, I am, I felt my own. I amness, as she said, and I've never felt that before. And if I could feel I am so strongly, then who I am hasn't been diminished at all. I can still feel it now. And it's something very peaceful, but I feel very alive. And, and he answered that is the joy of being and that is who you are you can only feel that when you get out of your head and it has to be felt it can't be thought the ego doesn't know about it because thought is what the ego consists of the ego is only thought it is that computer it is that robot and the ring was really in your head as a thought that you confused with the sense of I am. You thought the I am or a part of it, a part of I am was in the ring. So he, in essence, again, he says you can value and care for things, but whenever you get attached to them that way, then you will know that that is your ego. And I think that's a great place to stop. The, obviously, this can this discussion is going to go on and on. Mm -hmm. um, and do we have more to say? Do we want to come back tomorrow and talk about this some more? I know you had more points to make. Um, I think I had some more points to make. 
So yeah. um, we'll have a little bonus podcast tomorrow to go with this and um, come back tomorrow and check it out. And we'll continue this discussion. And anything else to add to that really quick? Um, no. Okay. Yeah. We'll Thanks see. for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. See ya. <laughs>